Welcome to the Utah Built Podcast, celebrating the people, personalities, businesses, and brands that are uniquely Utah Built. I am Jared Banks, your host, alongside co-host Kimball Care, and we had a big celebration with the first episode of Utah Built that featured you. And uh, very lucky that you'll be back on every episode with us to celebrate. Yeah, thanks for having me around. Everything that is Utah, Bill. It was your idea to talk about. It, it was thanks for having me around. <laughs> yeah, thanks for keeping me around. <laughs> well, it was fun. I'm we had to still be here. We had a good time, and we're going to continue that today with uh, a personal friend of both of ours and a man who's very well known throughout not just the sporting community but the business community. The president of Real Salt Lake, John Kimball. How are you, brother? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Welcome to Utah Happy to be Bilk. here. Yeah, I'm excited. So give us the Reader's Digest version of who is John Kimball? Where are you from? Talk about like just your your brief childhood here in Utah. Yeah, born and raised Salt Lake City. Uh, grew up in the Avenues. Uh, went to East High School. Um, college was a bit of a mess. I was all over the place. I, I, I think it took me eight years to get through, but I did four study abroads. Uh, and just wanted to see the world, but played rugby uh, through high school, through college, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm just still pinching myself that I'm employed. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about that because you kind of threw in the rugby connection, obviously, that we have here. You played at Highland High School. You were part of one of those first national championship teams for what went on to become a dynasty here in American rugby. Yeah, it was, you know, we had, I think, one of the worst high school football teams at East High School when I was playing uh, football. And there was eight of us that were like, we want to we wanna keep playing some contact sport and heard about Highlands. And we went over and tried out because uh, Highland at that time would take anybody because it was the only high school rugby program that was running in the state of Utah. So we had no idea. I think I started my sophomore year. Uh, long story short, you know, we had to qualify to go. The first year we went and we took second place. The next year we went was the first time we took first place. And it was just an amazing experience. And that's where I fell in love with the game and uh, learned a lot of really cool things about life and teams and loyalty and all that kind of stuff through Highland Rugby. So it was fantastic. Now tell us a little bit about that. What was some of the lessons that you learned and, you know, how that's, you know, affected you in, in terms of your role with RSL and some of the other jobs that you've had? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously they, they'd made a movie out of it and Larry Gelwick's... A movie out of, out of your time? Out of or my just... time, yeah. It's called <laughs> The Life of John Kimball. <laughs> <laughs> Life and Times. No, no. Uh, yeah, they, they made the movie about Highland Rugby and they tried to portray Larry Gelwicks and, and really, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that have opinions about Larry, but he is one of the biggest mentors I've ever had in my life. And it was very true that he engaged in, in just really connecting with, with trying to build young men into something more than just a rugby player. And he was a good friend of my father's, and I thought that's why he was being cool to me, but found out later in life that he was connecting with a lot of the players on the team and would he'd tell you to step into his office and the whole thing that they did in the movie. And, uh, and he, he really uh, brought a lot of testosterone and ego together to you know come together to make something happen. And at the end of the day, it was you know for us to not be any good at football and then to go and win a national championship uh, in another sport was, you know, pr a powerful experience for a young kid to go through. And, and I think it, it taught me discipline. It taught me, you know, when, when a team comes together, I mean, we, I was in the scrum and so we had the whole call of, you know, coming together, sinking and push, and we would wreck people. We would wreck college teams. We would just run over people because of the discipline and the hard work and you know the extra effort that you had to put in off the field and and so those were a lot of things that i've taken you know through my life that that i think larry gave gave us as, as young men is that where your connection to the business of sports started because to fill in the gap here you had to stop playing because of a medical condition and kind of made a turn right with a you have a, a congenital heart condition right yeah yeah I've, i think i've got a lot of issues but. <laughs> 
But that's <laughs> not a lot that will stop us from playing them. sports. Some, no. some, yeah. some self-inflicted, maybe. They put yeah. a hard a stop on your yeah. playing career medically, right? <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I played. Like I said, I played a little bit in college, and then, um, you know, it's interesting you say that because when I when I think about it, I, I mean, it's it's funny. I'm not the biggest sports fan, and and this is weird because I've been in sports my whole career. But I love the business of sports. I love, you know, creating opportunities. I love the vision of bringing people together and, and you know, the, the whole business side of it. I don't, you know, I, 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 I do have favorite teams and all that kind of stuff, but that's not the driver for me. It's actually, you know, creating, uh, you know, just the whole business side behind it. And I fell in love with that in college and saw, you know, you know where that would go and, uh, my first opportunity in the business of sports was working for KSL and we had the rights to BYU football and basketball and all their other sports. And I had the opportunity to kind of take that over when I was working there. And, and that's where I caught the bug. And I was like, this is awesome because there's just so many different aspects to sports. I just was talking to a kid in college just yesterday and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about going to law school and I was like, well, there's lawyers in sports and then there's finance people in sports and then there's marketing and there's media and then there's sales and there's almost anything you can imagine. Sports has something along those lines that you could get into and then you have the passion behind the sport. Then it's something that you love and every Saturday or Wednesday or whenever it is, you're rooting for your team and you, you, the highs and the lows. And I'm like, I'm still just on such a high and have such a buzz for our club and what we do and when we live, win and lose and you know it's just awesome so well and you your history you, you've got a little bit of a different story than most people within the sports industry here in utah you started one of your first big jobs was here with real salt lake when they first kicked off right yeah and I now you and now, employee. and now you've come full circle yeah so no, tell us a little bit about that that's been a trip i I got hit in the head so many times in rugby that I don't, <laughs> I don't remember a lot of it. But I, but as far Same as time. I remember, I was the first employee. Trey might argue with me on that, but I can, I can beat him down if I have to. Um, David Checkets uh, had bought a company called Sports West mm -hmm. that KSL owned, and um, at that time he asked me to come and work with him. And we had the Mountain West Conference and the WAC television contracts. And it was during that time that he traveled to Real Madrid, hired by the NBA to take the NBA to Real Madrid. Mm. And when he went there, he was like, hey, this soccer thing's pretty cool. And what are you guys doing over here? And he fell in love with the game. And he came back and said, I'm bringing a sports franchise to Utah. So while I was working for him, he shifted gears and went to the MLS to get the team and, and brought the team here to Utah. And I was working for him at the time and so transitioned into my role at Real Salt Lake and worked for Real Salt Lake um, for about 12 years. And then I left uh, and went to the Utah Jazz for about five years. And then when uh, Deloy Hansen called me and he said, John, I need your help. I've, uh, we're in the process of selling this team. And I was like, how can I help? And he's like, well, I need you to come work for me. And I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. And he's like, no, 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 I really need your help. And I, I, you know, who do I need to talk to? And I said, well, you'd have to talk to the Millers. And he's like, okay, I'll call you right back. Two hours later, he calls me back and says, it's a done deal. You start tomorrow. <laughs> And I was like, wait, what? Love to be a fly on the wall for that yeah, conversation. No, and that, but, you want but, to talk about learning something yeah, from business, have Deloitte yeah. Hansen and Gail Miller having a conversation. Well, <laughs> about you. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, it was, I'm close to Deloitte and I have a lot of respect for him and certainly have a tremendous amount of respect for the Millers. And it was an honor to work with them. And it was an honor to come back and, and to participate in, and bringing the club, uh, you know, out of out of that era into where we are now, and uh, you know, a lot of great things are happening. And the new ownership has been fantastic. And and a year later, they put me in as the permanent president. And and so now we're just trying to move forward. And you are, and it was this way when you and I worked together very briefly. You are such a people guy. For as good as you are with like the spreadsheets and the nuts and bolts of the business. 
you, I think, really outshine so many others in your similar positions. In the, and it's something you guys have in common, actually. You're a people person first. Does that come from your ability to operate inside a sports team? Does that parallel for you? Does that core value run? It comes from the common name. That's right. I, I, yeah. I'm named after John. Little. All right, people, I'll show people, myself out. Pe pe people don't How realize. That true? I was <laughs> actually named after John. You're older than me. How are you named after me? <laughs> Now we're getting into some tall tales. <laughs> it's now thicker. we're getting some tall All tales. Right. <laughs> but to your credit, in my experience always with you, and I know if I went around the building around the stadium here at America First Field and asked, I've heard from several other people in the building that credit you with changing an entire culture from the people first. Well, that's very kind. And, and I'll tell you, you know, cultures don't change with, without the people, all of the people coming together and making a conscious decision to change the culture and that's what happened here is we just we've got so many people who care about this club and so many people that had been here you know for many years and just knew what a, an amazing opportunity we had here and and wanted to you know keep things going and so you know i appreciate you saying that but i i, I think the reality is i don't know the nuts and the bolts and so all i have is my people skills <laughs> and so um, but I, it's funny cause when people ask me, I'm a, I'm a total introvert. I, I am very loyal to a very handful of people, but when I have to flip the switch for work and business, you know, I, I can, I can do that. But I, but I also just think if you have the opportunity to connect with people and take care of people, you're just going to get so much further than not, you know, cause I've, I've worked with and for people that demand respect instead of earn it or or try to push agendas or have you know how, however they think that works by fear or whatever intimidation and at the end of the day the pound of flesh is taken but if you connect with people and you get people to get behind a common cause and that you believe in something together it just makes it that much more meaningful you get that much further and it gives you purpose for what you're trying to accomplish and i think that's that's what we're still trying to do here. So, you, you and I have commiserated quite a bit on what it is that we're building with the Warriors and kind of the early days of just the PB and J years that I've kind of commented on with what we've had with the Warriors. But tell us a story, you know, that maybe not a lot of people might be aware of of some of those early days with Real Salt Lake and really what it took to make this team as successful and a part of the this community as much as it is. Tell us maybe something that someone may not realize just how difficult those early days are with a, a fledgling professional sports team. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's funny because I look back on those times now with fondness thinking those were the best years because there was so much work and everybody was part of the team. Everybody was selling tickets. Everybody was selling sponsorships. I was just in with my head of marketing and my head of ticketing and I just said, look, if, if we're not going to win on the field, and if that's not anything that we can control, what are the things that we can control? And back in the day, um, we were just talking about how Kyle Beckerman, after practice, would come down to our office and just hang out and watch TV and walk around trolley corners and shake hands with people and introduce himself and, and, and want to know everybody's name on a first name basis. And, and I said, look, you know, at, during those times, we had players that would come into the office and make phone calls for ticketing. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing an <laughs> event where we had eight, ten players that were sitting at the phone saying, yeah, this is uh, Nick Ramondo calling. No, no, it's not. No, you know, it's really Nick. And he would carry on a conversation and engage and fan, just blow fans' minds. And we weren't winning at that time. And so our community became fans of the boys mm -hmm. and then they wanted to come out and support the team and then we started to win and i as i was mentioning to you guys earlier you know some somebody had said to me earlier today well, well are we going to go out and get a world cup player to come play for us and i said no we're going to get players and turn them into world cup players by playing for real salt lake that's how Kyle Beckerman got on the World Cup team. That's how Nick Ramondo. They didn't come as World Cup players. They came as Real Salt Lake players who won a national championship and then went to play for the World Cup. 
And that's, that's what we're trying to do with our homegrown. But, I, but it's, it's going back to those roots and it's going back to you know, players that will sign autographs. It, it's, it's going back to those moments. The MLS is in the process of, of coming out with a program where they're investing in the youth. And because they know if you get a six-year-old kid on board, I, and I, I gave that example earlier today. I said, my, my athlete was Walter Payton. Mm-hmm. I was eight years old. I didn't know anything about football. And I watched Walter Payton play the game. And I said, I want to be like him. I want to run the ball like him. I want to hit like him. I want to, every time I got tackled, I'd reach the ball forward like Walter Payton. Because he got, who knows, a thousand more yards in his career. Because every time he reached it forward, he was just driving for something else every time he touched the ball. And to this day, Chicago Bears have been my team. I don't know if I can name another Chicago Bear player, but Walter Payton, when I was eight years old, was who I wanted to be like. And that's stuck with me my, my whole life. So the real question, John, is can you do the Super Bowl shuffle? I can. <laughs> <laughs> but do you I might, know the words? I might hurt Give myself. us your best Jim McMahon Jim on McMahon. that one. Jim <laughs> McMahon, yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. Now, yeah. You helped transition Real Salt Lake from those early fledgling days, playing at Rice Eccles Stadium to you were here when we opened up this stadium. You also were able to manage another very difficult time in the history of this franchise where there was a potential that we might not have Real Salt Lake in Utah. Talk about that. And I want to know how close we really were to losing our team here. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Um, I... I don't know if I was just being ignorant or didn't want to know because uh, I was so focused on on the club being here. And it was really I, I had the opportunity to go back east and and go to uh, the MLS offices. And and Don Garber, the commissioner, asked me to come sit down with him. And he said that very thing to me. He goes, John, you have no idea how close you guys were to losing that team. And I was like, I don't want to know. Because I wasn't, that's not where my head was. I was so focused on this club being here. And Dave Checkett's worked so hard to bring this club here. And, you know, we won a national championship based on, you know, this was a team that qualified in the Eastern Conference from the bottom. I don't even know how that happens now. And made it all the way through to win against David Beckham's LA Galaxy, you know, in front of, the Seattle crowd that was actually rooting for us because LA was so arrogant. They went up there and thought everybody was going to root for them. And we actually went out into the streets with our players and just rallied the community. And they're like, yeah, we want real, we want real Salt Lake to win this game. And so, I mean, next to the birth of my children, that was like a highlight of my life was to sit in that stadium and, and to see us win that cup. And, you know, I mean, Utah's, we got a chip on our shoulder, you know. We're a we're a small big city and we want to be recognized by Chicago and New York and LA and Seattle and it's we want to do things as good as these other major cities, but we're not a major city, but we want to prove that we belong and when we win national championships I think that's the core of Utah built when we look at it, right? When we yeah. look about how we manage, especially in sports, because I think in all three, you could even say four of the major sports, we're the smallest market of any of those major sports as far as population size. And yet we continue to exceed and excel because of just sheer grit and determination. You know, and you think about the history of the state and what it means to build that. So let me throw this at you. What's something you wish you knew getting into sports management and running a team in a business that you wish you knew when you started? Hmm. What's what's the hardest lesson you learned that you wish you knew getting in? The hardest lesson I learned. That's a great question. My I, answer to that question was John Kimball. Yeah. Just so we're on the same page. That's what I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I Back in the day say, when I when I needed to get into sports, yeah, I wish I had known John Kimball. I wished I would have invested in Apple. Because <laughs> then I wouldn't have had to do That's one of those like anything. Facebook questions, right? Like tell yeah. your fifteen year old self something in three words. And yeah. It's like Amazon, Apple, Google. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I really do think that it's just not listening to the naysayers, you know? 
I mean, where you guys are at with the Warriors, I mean, we were there, and it's and it's people. I remember a jazz exec not recognizing us, recognizing us as a professional team and just saying, what are you talking about? That's Funny, a, that sounds really that's familiar, not a doesn't it? That team. sounds odd, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, and I, <laughs> and, I, and I clue into that because I, I recognize that for you because we were in those same shoes where people are like, yeah, we don't recognize that. And, and yet, in a, in a very short couple of years, we were kicking the crap out of the jazz. You remember when we were giving tickets away on radio, they didn't want to go to the jazz. Nope. They, they wanted to go to Real Salt Lake for games. the tickets that we had for and them. That was just a lot of just grunt, hard work, getting fans on board, getting promotions and players into the community. Obviously, the Jazz were in a slump at that point, and that was perfect timing for us. Jazz is doing fantastic now. Love the Jazz. You know, worked there for years, but it was just fun for us for a period of time to be relevant when people didn't want to recognize that we were. And then to win the only national championship in our community is, you know, every now and again, I'll just throw the ring on. And if I have a, you know, a meeting with somebody from the jazz and you know, just a little just flex, tap it on the table, you know, a little bit. Happy to say I've, I've been able to wear that ring. I have pictures with that yeah. ring. It's really cool. And, and cool also that that trophy is literally almost above our heads as we sit here yeah. right now. Kimball, correct me if I'm wrong now, because you said something similar to, to John that you're both almost glad you didn't know better when you started. Yeah. Right? Well, and I said, you know, last week that uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the biggest thing that I, I'm like you, when we went at, when I decided to get into the sports business, it was about helping and giving back to the community, right? But you just don't know how hard it is. Yeah. It, it's such a difficult enterprise. It's one of the most difficult things, but at the same time, it's also one of the most rewarding because you don't see people walking around going back to the apples. You don't see people walking around with apple tattoos. Yeah. You see him walking around with Real Salt Lake, yeah. Utah Jazz, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. There's there's a sense of meaning and belonging that comes from sports that's oh, impactful yeah. and powerful. Yeah, I mean, we had a story just the other day, and, you know, you, you put all of this aside when you hear a story where Justin Glad was running off the field and there was a – I'm going to get emotional. This kid was there, and Justin just happened to run over to him and took his jersey off and gave it to the kid – and didn't know that the kid had lost his mother the night before. Oh, and his wow. dad brought the kid to the, to the Real game to just get him to, you know, to be normal for a second. And the dad reaches out to us and just was like, you guys just, I mean, he was emotional, just lost. He was just like, you just, you made such an impact on this kid during this moment of just absolute, you know, horror. And it was just so cool that just that Justin had no idea and he just had that small thing happen. And you're like, well, that's why we do this. I mean, this is, I mean, obviously it's for profit and everybody's working and all those great things. But then you hear a story like that and you're like, wow, that, that, makes, that, that makes it really meaningful because that kid will never forget that experience. And it's just, it's so much fun to hear those type of stories and know that you have an impact on on somebody for whatever reason I, i've i've had dad say this is the only time my daughter will talk to me she's 14 we come to real salt lake games we sit next to each other and it's the only time that we talk and we cheer and he's like i don't even like soccer but i like being here with my daughter because she's a fan and thank you for this and you're like ah, oh, it's you know that's so and that's what sports does is it brings us together it brings a community that might have social differences and all the crap that's going on in the world and you put it all down you put the colors on you come to the game you root for the team and you know it's just an amazing gathering all are welcome opportunity that it i don't know where else you can find that yeah you know that's the amazing thing about sports but within that john i'd love to to kind of hear your vision now that you're kind of in the driver's seat well you are in the driver's seat right where do you see real salt lake what's the vision for real salt lake and this community in the next 10 years you know i'm super excited because um you know i've i've had the opportunity to talk to different people there's a lot of exciting things happening in sports potentially in the future but i'll be honest and i'm a little bit bold about this 
there's one league where the trajectory is like this. And it's because in 2026, the biggest event in the history of sports in the United States is going to happen in America. And I actually had the opportunity to meet some people from FIFA last week, and he corrected me and he said, John, it's the biggest event in the history of sports in the world because it's happening in America mm -hmm. and it's the World Cup. And there is nothing that will be bigger than that in the history of our country or the world than to have the World Cup happen in 26 in the United States. And it's just going to be mind bending. And people in America just can't wrap their heads around it yet because we're just still 20 years behind, you know, just like with rugby. We're still 20, 30 years behind the rest of the world in recognizing these two beautiful sports. But in 2026, the world and America will wake up and go, what is going on? Because this is the most amazing thing to happen. And it's going to happen right here in the United States. And we're going to have people from around the world. You had Dubai. Who could go to Dubai? Nobody. I'm not in that tax bracket. Yeah. Before that, <laughs> before that, four years before that, it was in Russia. Who's going to Russia? Nobody. Who's coming to the United States? Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody's going to come here. The trajectories like this, the pivot, the tipping point is going to be like, the, it's, it's going to be just mind blowing. Well, I'll see your soccer world cup and raise you the news that, you know, the rugby world cup is also coming just a, what five years after the yeah. soccer world cup. So thank you for laying all the groundwork for yeah. us so that we can have this incredible infrastructure for the real biggest event. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> telling you, I'm telling you that will be, it, it will be a tipping point for your sport. Yeah. It absolutely will be because people will just be like, Oh my gosh, what a beautiful game. I mean, look at these guys. This is unbelievable. And to bring it here and to have kids, that are eight years old or six year olds see it happen in their community and their mom or dad take them to a game, they're just gonna be like, oh, this is what I wanna do. And it's gonna be tipping points for us. Yeah. I can give you that moment for my kids since you were sharing the story about Justin. Nick, when he was still playing, my kid was seven years old and we were standing by the tunnel. He had just started playing soccer and there was a girls team sitting on the players' benches for warmups and Nick came off and he's always one of the last to come off for his warmups. And my kid Nugget wanted nothing more than just to, just to see him, just to have him walk by. Nick walked over to the sideline, said hi to every girl on that sideline, saw my son, ignored me, made eye contact <laughs> with me, and then I was non-existent. Got but, down but you're on not, one, you're not bitter. Got down <laughs> on one, I, as a dad, like when you talk about yeah. getting emotional, as a dad, yeah. that player, took a moment to give my kid yeah. that memory. Yeah. I see our players do it. And I think it's something that sports as a whole, that we as a whole, as people, right, that we can learn. Just in that one small moment of kindness, yeah. that it changed the whole trajectory and outlook of his life. Oh, yeah. You know, no, and, it, and sports did that for all three of us. Yeah. You know, and it continues to do that. For other generations and now he's the he's the diehard goalie oh he's he wears 18 yeah for that very reason yeah. no you know? and it's i mean it, that that can be a trigger for a kid to just say i want sports to be the thing in my life and there's kids that don't get that opportunity or don't see it or don't and you know that's one of the things as a mantra for our club is we create memories that are life-altering, life-changing. I mean, like the kid I told you about with his mom, we had another kid that just wrote a letter saying, I want to come to a game. I'm one of seven. My dad can't afford it. I want to surprise him. He works two jobs. They're coming to our next home game, and I can't wait to just, you know, get behind all of that and, and let their family experience what what this can do because that's that's the real, that's the fun stuff. So what's one thing that's held true for you? Because you've worked in media, you've worked in management, you've worked in business, you've worked in retail, you've had all of these different roles and hats that you've worn. What's the one thing for you from a business standpoint that's held true through all of those things? Oh, you, you mentioned it earlier. It's just people, you know, just focusing on people and, uh, and you know, just being human and, and compassion and caring and kindness. You know, those are the things that win. 
And when you have leadership that recognizes those things, but then also expects, you know, results and get things done, um, when you just focus on, on you know, it's uh, the Good to Great book is one of my favorite books, and it just talks about getting people on the bus, getting them in the right seats, and then making sure everybody's headed in the same direction. But it's it's just making sure that you have good people on board the bus that want to accomplish the same thing. So, and that's what makes it, you know, a family. You know, whether it's dysfunctional or not, it's still a family, and and you you have a common goal, a common purpose to to achieve. But you you keep the human side in the forefront. You know, that's where I think you really see success. You know, we talk about KPIs a lot in business, right? You know, mm. Key performance indicators. And for as cheesy as it is, I saw a meme on Instagram that says that we should get rid of that mentality and that KPI should stand for keep people interested. Because if they're interested and invested in what you're doing, the rest of it will just take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And I thought from a management position, from a people position, that was the best lesson that I could take from that, you know? And it just, and it was doom scrolling through Instagram while I'm laying in bed and I saw that. And it was just that light bulb moment, you know? Yeah. So let's get more into your Utah roots. Mm. You are an avid backcountry skier, are you not? I try to be, yes. <laughs> that is one of my biggest packs. So how did you get into doing that as an extreme sport? Because I know you've been doing it for a long time. You were doing it before it was cool to do. Now there's videos of kids doing it, and they're sponsored by all these different. You still go out and do it just for the love. What's some of the cool things that you've learned up there on the mountains? Because it's quiet. Yeah, it's you're standing on a ridge looking yeah. 10,000 feet down going, I'm yeah. going to go from here to there. Yeah. And somehow make it out alive. Well, we just we live in just a magical place. And, and you know, the Olympics screwed that up for us by telling everybody <laughs> about it. But it's just that it's that I just I love the exercise of hiking up and and the solitude. I, I you know, I'm, I shouldn't say this because I shouldn't encourage it, but I go by myself mainly because it's just that peace and quiet that I just so enjoy. And it's just that, that we can be there in 15, 20, 30 minutes, and I can be on a ridge at 10,000 feet looking down at just some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. And there's just nothing like it, you know, and to be here in Utah and to have that experience and to, you know, be able to, to go on what I call a quiet walk uh, is just, Amazing. Is that what you tell your wife? I'm just going for a walk, baby. Yeah. I'll be back later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here's my here's Hopefully. my beacon. Hopefully yeah. I'll yeah. be back. Here's yeah. my transponder. Yeah. If I go, I always say if I go that way, that would be one of the best ways to go. So I couldn't complain. <laughs> With a smile on your face. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. We should all be so lucky. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Yeah. So last question for you. What does it mean to you personally, not just as a brand? not as the, the head of an incredible sports organization with Real Salt Lake. What does it mean to you to be uniquely Utah built? I mean, it's something I'm extremely proud of, and I'm not sure if there's a, a, a slogan here that I'm supposed to drop, but, but being Utah built is being, I mean, I'm a locals, locals, local. I mean, Kimball, they're the, they're the people who built this place and, and we go way back and I'm very proud to be Utah built and to represent our state. And, you know, it feels like the world is now waking up to who we are and what we are and the industry that is behind our people, the compassion and the love, the community that's here, but also, you know, the chip on our shoulder, like I mentioned earlier that we want to perform and we want to do well and, and we do, very well and we are ranked in the top you know five of almost everything that's good and 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 that's just something i'm incredibly proud of to be utah built and to have my my namesake and to be raise my family here and to and to have roots and to be from this beautiful place and talk about it i mean i've had the opportunity to live and travel all over the world there's nothing like utah absolutely nothing like it and I have no interest in going anywhere but being right here. So, Well, we appreciate you taking some time, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say, you know, at least from my side, just I don't know that people really fully understand the support that 
this guy has given not only me personally, but also this organization with the Utah Warriors. And we're only two episodes into this Utah Built podcast, and I couldn't have think of anyone else better that we wanted to have right after the, the Warriors story to be able to tell a little bit about that Utah Built story from what you've done, not only as a, a rugby player, and but also now as helping – you know, bring some of these amazing sports to the state of Utah. So thank you for that. Thank you for helping us along the way and being a big support to everything that you've not only done in this community, but also for, for our organization. Thank you. Well, you're very kind. I appreciate that. And, and we're, you know, I mean, you guys are great partners and we look forward to a long future and I'm a huge rugby fan. I couldn't, I couldn't be a bigger rugby fan. And I just want to see the sport the sport grow and be as successful as we've been able to be and the opportunities there it's coming it's growing and it's you guys got a great organization great people again like we talked about and uh, there's a great opportunity here in utah uniquely utah built celebrating the people the personalities the brands and the businesses that are unique to utah and built right here in the Beehive State. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, stream the podcast wherever you get your audio, YouTube, and more. Check out all the links on behalf of our production team, John Kimball and the Real Salt Lake family. My co-host, the ever-ruggedly handsome and debonair Kimball Care. I'm Jared Banks. Thank you. We'll see you on the next Utah Built.